Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections. And we're asking how serious is the decline of Japan's economy? And how does that decline affect the region? Uh, with Carl Baker, the handsome young man on the screen with me. Welcome to the show, Carl. Good to be back, Jay. It's always nice to hear people say that I'm looking young. <laughs> <laughs> I try. So uh, Carl Baker is a senior advisor to Pacific Forum. We're going to talk today about uh, one of his favorite topics, that is uh, the economies uh, of, of Asia, Indo-Pacific. And we're going to find out what, what is the problem in Japan and how serious is it and how is it going to affect not only Japan, but the other countries in the region? This is very important. We can't get tied up in things happening in Europe or, for that matter, domestic things. We have to keep our eyes peeled on all parts of the world. And Carl can help us do that. Welcome, Carl. And can you tell us what the problem is in Japan? Well, the problem is, of course, that uh, Japan is shrinking in, in terms of population and uh, the economy is uh, is sort of shrinking along with it. But having said that, you know, uh, I think we need to remember that just last week, the Nikkei is, is reaching all-time highs. And so it's back. You know, the, the stock market is back. The economy isn't necessarily there, but uh, but the stock market is certainly showing a, a lot of signs of, of strength. And so, you know, I think uh, it, it's, it's kind of a mixed kind of a mixed bag of what's happening. The the yen is the yen is incredibly weak. It's 150 yen to the dollar these days, which, you know, just not that long ago we were complaining about it going under under parity, uh, got down of, into what the low 90s. And so, you know, so the so the yen is weak, which means there's people that see the um, Japanese market as a as an investable market. Uh, William or Warren Buffett Put big money in during the pandemic. He saw that as an opportunity, and and clearly foreign investors are the ones that are pushing that market up. So, uh, you know, they they either know something or they're getting sucked into a into a market that's going to disappoint. Well, you know, you you mentioned that the Nikkei going up, but so is the American stock market, and I have long believed that you know we have a lot of trouble here in this country and. It's not only economic trouble, it's um, political and social trouble. We have a lot of mm, poor people uh, who are impoverished and homeless for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, we have you know, a lot of discomfort and disruption in the country um, and a lot of political mm, aggravation in the country. Um, but the market goes up, okay? And, and, and after a while, you got to say what you said, as a gee, nice that it went up, but this isn't real. And the question is, uh, is, that, is that a parallel? In, uh, in Japan with the Nikkei? Is, is it going up, but is it real? Yeah, and, and it's a fair question. That's why I tried to say, you know, the, the, the market is going up, the population is going down, the, the, uh, the, the, the strength of the economy doesn't seem to be there to justify what's happening. You know, but having said that, you know, there's, there's some positives in, in Japan, I think. There's, uh, you know, there's, there's a big, as we move away from, de or we, as we de-risk from China, in the in the words of uh, the economists, uh, Japan becomes an attractive spot to to invest in semiconductors in 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 creating uh, semiconductor fabrication plants. You know, it it has it has a place in in the electronics industry that is trying to reclaim from from the good old days when J Japan led the electronics market. If you were, some of us remember that in the seventies and eighties when you had to have that stereo from Japan. You know, and so they're trying to make a play back into the electronics market. They're trying to do reform. You know, ever since Abe, you know, with his with his structural reform and uh, fiscal monetary reforms, they're they're they've, they're trying. You know, and Kashida, Prime Minister Kashida, is back trying to do structural reform one more time. So you know, so so there's signs. Uh, there, there's some positive signs in Japan. Uh, you know, they they just fell the the GDP. There were roughly what 4.2 million or 4.2 trillion, I should say. Uh, you know, is uh, fell to the fourth place behind Germany just uh, last year. Uh, you know, but it's still it's still a big economy. It's still the fourth largest economy, and uh, you know they're they're still producing goods. They're still producing cars. They're a little bit behind in the EV market, but uh, you know what what seems to be happening now is uh, Toyota's hybrid. Uh, 
approach seems to be working, at least in the United States, where people are moving more toward a hybrid car than a than an EV. So you know, so so there's there's signs that that uh, it is coming back a little bit in the in the traditional areas where Japan has excelled, most specifically automobiles and uh, and the electronics industry. So you know, so I think there's there's positive signs, but you know, you've still got uh, a lot of weakness just from from the population decline. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the bell curve. You know, when I first started looking at this, just twenty years ago, the the concern was the bell curve was upside down, and they were not having, they were not getting married. The Japanese weren't getting married. They were enjoying themselves. Young people were enjoying themselves. They had a lot to do, a lot of excitement, a lot of mm, creature comforts and consumer consumer attractions. Um, and so there weren't as many kids. And and since they're, you know, they kind of the Japanese do things together. You know what I mean, they're they're a uh, a culture that does things together. Everybody got on that bandwagon. Nobody got married. Nobody had kids. And the bell curve was upside down. And when you have a bell curve problem like that, ultimately, you know, in the future, you're going to suffer for it because you don't have people, new people, new entrants into the workforce and the pipeline and so forth. Goldman Sachs, and I, I think I told you about this, Goldman Sachs says, and Goldman Sachs is big in Japan. And I remember that Goldman Sachs handled a transaction where a Japanese investment company bought Alamoana Center for lots of money. Goldman Sachs was there representing that Japanese company. And they are international, of course, um, but they're big in Japan. Goldman Sachs said that Japan was likely to drop out of the top five, you say the top four right now, drop out of the top five economies by 2050 which is, you know, this is something over 20 years from now, and out of the top 10 by 2075. I frankly do not know how Goldman Sachs could make projections <laughs> that far out, but that's what Goldman Sachs said. Your comment? Yeah, well, I, again, you know, I, I, I realize and I understand that that Japan is losing the, the share on, on the GDP because it is a shrinking a shrinking society. And India is certainly going to probably surpass it Fairly soon, they're they're just what they're at three and three something trillion now. So you have to believe that that India is probably nipping at their heels to to take over that fifth that fourth spot. Uh, you know, but uh, again, Japan is trying. You know, they they finally started importing some laborers uh, more so now than they had in in the past. You know, so they're up to a couple million. It's not a lot, but but they probably are are ahead of that curve when you look at Korea. Taiwan, they still have a 1.4 uh, repopulation rate, which or birth rate, you know, which is which is better again than than Korea and, Japan, and Taiwan, you know. So and even better than China these days. So so Japan is yes, they they've had their problems. They've had their problems for as you say 20 years. You know, they they yes, they made a lot of bad real estate investments in the United States at the, in in. In the peak of the 1990s, uh, you know, we all remember those days when Japan was buying uh, trophy trophy real estate and uh, you know buying up neighborhoods at a time uh, on the on the uh, uh, residential markets. You know, so so yes, they've 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 hurt themselves. They've they've been punished for about 20 years. Uh, they they but they act like they're they're making some progress. You know, and when you compare it with the other Asian societies, and I think that's where we have to look. You know, compared to compared to China, compared to to Korea, they're they're showing some signs of life. They're they're not they're not out for the count. I don't think they're trying to do corporate reform. You know, they're trying to change that corporate culture of uh, of, of lack of innovation, of of you know, twelve hour work days and not a lot of productivity in that twelve hours. They're they're trying to trying to push innovation they're trying to push uh, you know the hybrid work where where people are incentivized to do pro production rather than just sit in the office you know so i think i i see some real hope for japan that, that they're, they're they may be post postmodern uh society where some of the rest of us are still going into that postmodern where where we start losing productivity where we uh, struggle with uh, with population decline and all that. I think maybe Japan is is seeing the other side, 
it's not it's not as rosy as as you might like it to be, but I think they they're starting to see uh, the other side beyond that inverted bell. I like to examine the you know, the cultural connection. Um, you know, when you know certainly you raised such a good point about about how the Japanese came to Hawaii, for example. And they would come in groups, and the groups would, you know, have this kind of consensus decision process. Mm -hmm. where they all sat around in a meeting, and when they were finished with one meeting, they would have a second meeting and a third meeting, all together now, on and on and on. And then they would make a decision to buy something at way more than the true value or the appraised value. They would buy it, as you say, for a trophy. And you said to yourself, gee whiz, they're spending a lot of money. In, in an investment which may not be as certain as it looks to them. Um, and if they keep on doing that, it's not sustainable. And if they keep on doing that in Hawaii or the mainland or elsewhere, uh, they're going to be spending too much. They're going to be hurting themselves. This is a flawed decision process uh, about how they invest. And you know, wouldn't you say that this is somehow responsible for the problems that I have seen in, you know, in my reading on this, asset deflation, liquidity trap, high inflation, low wage growth, and a delayed recovery following the pandemic. In other words, this is a flaw in the way their system works, their corporate decision process works, and it has had effect in various, you know, various components of their economy. And query first, do you agree with all of that? And Second is, is this something, this is structural. Is this something that can be, is being corrected? Uh, when you say the market's going up and they're looking better in certain ways, is it because these things are being corrected or do we still have these flaws? Well, the answer is yes to both. I mean, I, I think, I think there, there is some recognition that, that, it, that things need to be fixed. For example, the, 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 the immigration policies are slowly changing. Foreigners are, are slowly being recognized as vital to this, uh, to, to this recovery. You know, and so I think I, I think that that in that sense there's 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 hope. But yes, they still suffer from that 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 cultural decision making process that that is very cumbersome, very consensus oriented, and there's still the mindset of of you have to be in the office longer than the boss. You know, and and that's that that lends and the whole the whole uh, employment for a lifetime, you know, is still is still there. And so that 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 ultimately is is a problem that that that's recognized, and they're working. You know, remember Abe Abe managed to do finance, fiscal, and and monetary policy, but he never quite got to structural reform. You know, and now Kashida is kind of in the same place. His popularity is pretty low. It's in the twenties. You know, and and he's saying I'm going to do structural reform, and and really it, it comes down to can the government actually push structural reform beyond just words on paper, and that's and that's where the struggle comes. You know, as you say, the, the, the Japanese tend to be very comfortable in inside their inside their cocoon called Japan. You know, uh, our, our, my my good friend Brad Wasserman, you know, wrote wrote the book Peak Japan. And and that was part of the criticism that that he leveled against them is that you know you're 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 comfortable in in this in this uh, society that uh, doesn't really look at itself very critically sometimes, and I think that that's that's where where they're at. But again, I, you know, I see I see these sort of glimmers of glimmers of of uh, reconstruction, if you will, of the electronics industry, driven partly by the de-risking that's going on in in China. You know, Japan becomes a pretty attractive place when you when you look at it. It's got it's got the infrastructure to to develop uh, the electric to redevelop the electronics industry. And so I think you know that there's there's uh, there's some hope. You know, they're they're trying to reform some of their uh, some of their retirement systems. You know, the 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 old postal postal savings account system is is sort of going by the wayside. Where they're they're trying to be more more focused on a on a more dynamic kind of retirement retirement system for people, so you know, I, I think I think there's at least a recognition that there's a need to change. Now the question is, can they actually execute it? Can they actually convince the Japanese themselves to to change the system? And I think you know the the migrant the migrant workers 
are, are going to force some of that. And, and there's probably going to be a backlash against these migrant workers, much like there is, you know, in the rest of the world. But at least they're recognizing that, that a, a, a pure Japan is not sustainable and that you need, to, you need to think about innovation and you need to think about bringing in workers who, who don't necessarily follow some of those old norms that, that they have for the past, for the past century. Yeah, let me let me break that down into uh, two questions that come to my mind. One is that we know in the 21st century that leaders, however they got to be leaders, are more powerful. Uh, autocrats are certainly more powerful and seem to be more autocrats these days. And we have in the you know the United States the president, whether he's uh, a, a budding autocrat like Trump or or um, you know Joe Biden, they're more powerful. They got more to do. People surrender. People meaning the whole electorate, the whole base of people seem to surrender more power, expect more of them, and give them more power to do stuff. And I would imagine that's the way it is in Japan, too. Now, some of the criticism that I've seen, or the, the fault that I've seen in reading on this, is that um, people in Japan and outside, to lay the blame uh, for this um, recession, this stagnation, if you will, what do they call it? the lost decade, and that means the decade ending now, but it could go forward for more decades, uh, at the feet of the leaders. And I think you, you intimated that in your remarks a minute ago, that yes, um, people may recognize it. I mean, they're reading, writing, thinking, um, but it takes a leader to execute, a, to develop and execute a plan to correct things. And that would be the same in every country in the world. You need the leader, and since the leader is more powerful, um, you know, the, the fault or, or the credit, as it were, uh, is on the leader. So is it is I haven't followed who is the leader, you know, of Japan for the past 10 years. But the implication is that the leaders of Japan are really not well selected, not well fitted to be leaders in an economy that needs work. Uh, well, I mean, the you know the the Liberal Democratic Party has really sort of regained complete control of of the of the political of the political system in Japan. You know, there there was there was a time when when there was an opposition that was was meaningful. Kameto and the, D, the DPP they were they were there. They they they've, they've sort of fallen by the wayside. Uh, you know, over since really since Abe came back, and Kashida is is really sort of a disciple of Abe and. In many ways, that that this this there's 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 elements in the LDP that that are are in opposition, but not in a meaningful way. It's still strongly LDP. It's still largely a single party uh, political system, uh, and I don't see a lot of interest in in changing that right now. I think that that uh, there's there's uh, really not much opposition. Uh, to to Kishida. that's why he can stay in power with with you know twenty percent approval rating. There, there doesn't really seem to be any impetus within the diet, the legislation, the legislative branch, to uh, to to change the leadership. So, yeah, I think I think uh, political leadership has been a problem and will be a problem. You know, there's there's a really fine line that they have to walk uh, on 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 history, on trying to establish relations uh, with the rest of Asia. They still struggle with the Korean relationship. Uh, it's it's better. Than it was, uh, you know, uh, mostly from the South Korean side. The the Japanese are, are, are still sort of the recipients of a lot of hostility in China, of course, and and even the even South Korea, while it's moving toward better defense cooperation uh, in the face of of a threatening North Korea and certainly of a growing China. You know that there's there's a, a better defense relationship between South Korea and, and Japan, and there certainly is a strong economic ties between Korea and Japan because Korea continues to to take advantage of its its strength, its economic strength vis-a-vis -vis Japan. So you know I think that that yes there is a problem with economic with with political leadership, uh, but again it's it's a slow process in trying to trying to implement economic reform in that system. And so, uh, you know, the, the fact that, that Kishida is still talking about structural reform should be encouraging, even though, you know, it's, it's been a real tough slog trying to, trying
trying to implement those kinds of changes in in the retirement system, in the in the whole approach to innovation and things like that. You know, talk about um, you know n new entrants uh, in terms of migration and immigration into Japan, acceptance of uh, new members of the labor force and the community. Um, I think Japan has a problem with that. Uh, if you look at Singapore, for example, Singapore will say one day, hmm, we need a million more people for our workforce, and they will open the spigot. And and next thing you know is there's a, another million people from a half a dozen countries uh, feeding into their workforce, and they have systems to provide housing and jobs on day one. This is really like you know a continuing miracle in Singapore. Um, they're really smart. They're really clever. And they and they understand that an economy is based on new entrants into the workforce and and the, and the consumer force, if you will. So it works in Singapore, but in Japan, it's it's hard to get a permanent residence. Um, it's hard to hold um, a joint uh, citizenship between the U.S. and Japan. You can't. You can't do it. And that's that's uh, the U.S.'s fault as, as well. Um, I know a guy who uh, he married a Japanese woman, was so infatuated with the culture that he went to Japan and took out Japanese citizenship, thus losing his American citizenship. Uh, and he went into a restaurant. And it had a little sign at the front window and said, only Japanese involved. And they threw him out. Um, and then he said, wait a minute. I am a Japanese citizen, legally just as much as anyone in this place. And they said, no, nah, no, nah, don't give us that. You're not Japanese. He sued. And ultimately, he went up to the Supreme Court of, the, of Japan, and he got a very mixed bag result. But he had lost his American citizenship, and he was stuck with his Netherland of being a Japanese citizen, but not a Japanese. So this kind of resistance, you know, toward new entrants, resistance toward migration, this also requires structural reform. And until they get that straight, I mean, it's great to have this kind of homogeneous population, but it doesn't work economically. Um, and uh, until they get that straightened out, I think they're going to be stuck. Do you agree? Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it's, it's absolutely a problem. I mean, you know, I mean, you've, you've, have heard stories that you know in in rural Japan you can basically buy a house for a song if you're willing to live in in one of those little dying communities that uh, you know doesn't have uh, much commerce anymore and uh, has has houses that are just derelict houses sitting there waiting for somebody to take ownership because you can't rent them out and the the family doesn't even want to deal with the taxes anymore. So, so yeah, I mean, r rural Japan is, is like that. But go to Tokyo, you know, and as you say, it's a vibrant, uh, exciting city that uh, has has an incredible amount of infrastructure and, and the efficiencies are, are amazing when you, when you look at what you can do in Tokyo. And that, that becomes a problem because you've got, you've got the cities and then you've got the rural areas where nobody really wants to live. Nobody wants to maintain uh, that that lifestyle. So immigrants are important, and and you know and and it, it's becoming more and more apparent. I think that that you need to do that. And so yes, it is part of the structural reform. That's right. And well, they for need to, they need to make it easier to come for the deflation of the of the yen. Um, seems to me that an American tourist has a huge advantage. Um, and an American investor has a huge advantage. And if you are so inclined to find a little rural town somewhere and you're charmed, and it is charming for sure, sure. Uh, in, in, in a great number of places in Japan and outside of Tokyo, um, you know, you would do well. You would get a bargain for that house, a real, real bargain, yeah. and you can live cheaply. Only thing is that after a while, they'll throw you out. So, so you have after, to after a while, you still aren't Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to cover one other thing with you, Carl, and that is, you know, you, so you have a kind of, um, I, I don't want to call it a domino effect, but you have Japan, which was for many, many years after the war. I mean, it was a, it was a spectacular miracle what happened after MacArthur and all that, how the economy soared to the heavens and was uh, providing products for the world that nobody could resist. First quality, everything first quality, cars, electronics, name it. Um, maybe not quite the case now. Um, and um, other countries are catching up. China is doing a lot of EVs. 
China is doing better electronics than it was before, uh, and, and on and on. But so the question I put to you is, how does Japan's decline, and whether Goldman Sachs is right or not, we know there's at least the possibility of a long-term decline here. At least there's a decline right now. There's a, there's a measurable decline right now, a lost decade. Um, how does that affect, A, Japan's relationships with the other countries in Asia and its position in the world uh, as, a, as a, call it a, an economic beacon? I mean, I think it's still there. I think uh, Japan is is a very developed economy. It, it certainly has has a high end uh, infrastructure in place that that can sustain a, a, a information age society. It still is very active in in Southeast Asia and 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 the Middle East. You know, when you when you go to Southeast Asia, the the one thing you always get from the Southeast Asians is that Japan has been a constant friend. That they have they have done incredible amount of infrastructure development in in terms of, of maritime security in terms of of economic development the, the the gold standard is still Japan in terms of infrastructure investment they they go to China because China has the Belt and Road and and they they are trying to to, to emulate Japan in some ways but the the fact is is that in Southeast Asia they still they still see Japan as as the the best economic partner uh, I'll say that you know and and of course the United States has always struggled struggled with with infrastructure development and infrastructure investment so Japan is still viewed very much as as a positive now having said that you also have a lot of competition in 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 Korea China Taiwan and and increasingly in Southeast Asia for the electronics market you know that that's something that that I think Japan has lost permanently but uh, again, the cars still a lot. Of, a lot of Southeast Asia drive uh, Japanese cars, and you know, and, and clearly, uh, you know, they're they're in competition with the with the Koreans and and the Chinese, especially China's uh, EV uh, vehicles are are moving moving in fast. But you know, I think that that Japan still has has a, a very good reputation in the rest of Asia. But yes, it is it is. Losing its market, its market attractiveness, and and how how de-risking from China plays into that is not is we shouldn't dismiss it. I think that that's that's something that that Japan is seen as as a very attractive alternative for some of the high end investment, and and again, it's another one of those structural reforms that Japan needs to pursue is foreign direct investment that they really need to rethink. How they how they approach foreign direct investment in 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 uh, semiconductor fab plants and and software uh, computer software all those things are available in Japan they've got the they've got the 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 educational capacity to really develop those industries so you know Japan Japan is still there Japan is going to be there as a as a high end economy and and it still is attractive to to Southeast Asia. There's a lot of Southeast Asians that go to school in Japan. And again, you know, it's all a matter of, of learning how to accept foreigners as a, a vibrant part of your economy, much like Singapore has. You know, although I, I'll, I'll make the comment on Singapore that just in today's paper, I saw that Singapore is once again raising the minimum wage for foreign workers because there's there's this, this increasing backlash in Singapore about the number of foreign workers. And so it's not it's not all roses in that part of the world either. <laughs> well, there's one other area I wanted to cover with you, and that's uh, you know, of course, you, you know, uh, rather uh, economics affect the image of a country, and Japan's image is good culturally uh, and and ethically. You know, you want to make a deal with a Japanese company, it's going to be reliable. They're going to follow through in the deal. They're not going to play with you, uh, and that is that is unique and important. Uh, to to know that Japan is like that, and it offers a, a a business environment that is worthy and really really attractive, and and we saw that here in Hawaii. They make a deal, mm -hmm. they follow through. Good, you know. As I say, there's two kinds of people in the world, two kind of nations in the world. One is the follow through nations, and the other is the others. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so 
um, that all feeds into geopolitics. You know, if we look at this whole patchwork of countries in Asia, your specialty really, and for that matter, Indo Indo Pacific um, and Central Asia, although they don't really play on the same field, um, you know, it, this changes the calculus, does it not? If Japan is seen as a, a power that has declined, and it's not clear, but could decline further, we don't really know yet. It's, the jury is out, really, in many ways. Um, but that changes the, the way other countries, mostly China, for example, maybe North Korea, uh, the way they see Japan as a player in the geopolitics, in the player of strategy, development of weapons and weapons systems, uh, of threats, of, you know, of mm, general, general geopolitical strategy, like, for example, around Taiwan. So my question to you is, how does this affect Japan's role geopolitically in the region? Well, I mean, you know, this goes back centuries where Japan has tried to play West West versus East, you know, and it wants to be the, the, the best partner to the West. And I think that this is what's happening today is Japan very much recognizes its decline and, and it has worked very hard to maintain a strong relationship with the United States because it sees the United States as its as its ultimate security partner in the face of a of a growing growing China threat, military threat, what, what Japan sees as a, as a military threat. And certainly in the context of Korea, you know, it sees the threat from North Korea, uh, the military threat from North Korea with its missile development and all that, you know, that I think Japan very much sees itself as tied to the presence of the United States in the region. And that's why I think Japan is so concerned about maintaining that relationship with the defense relationship with the United States. You know, and and again, this is another area that that there is some glimmer that Japan is beginning to recognize that it really does need to develop a defense industry. You know, and and so you know, this is something new. You know, based on Article Nine of the Constitution, which says that they can't develop, uh, you know, that that kind of industry. Where that's changing now, that that they have decided that they really can export weapons systems, and so so that's becoming another part of the potential economy that's developing in Japan is is a defense industry and a, and, a, and a defense industry complex that would be important to to a, a revived Japanese economy. So, you know, the geopolitics of it is is that Japan sees itself very much tied to the United States. It's that's one area that it's working very hard with South Korea to develop a better relationship with the South based on based on their their common military interests. And that's always been the strongest area, I think, for, for Japan and South Korea to work on is, is a, a better military relationship. The economies are, are quite integrated, actually, where the military has, has sort of struggled to, to maintain or to keep up with, with the economic side. So I think, you know, I think that, that uh, it, it plays geopolitics, but I think there, Japanese certainly recognize that they are in a weaker position than they would like to be, and therefore they have always tried to maintain that that appearance of a very strong relationship with the United States and very supportive of the United States in 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 both south in both Southeast Asia as well as uh, you know through the Quad with the Indians, the Australians, the Japanese, and the Americans. So I think you know that's that's really how I think Japan sees itself as sustaining in the strategic environment is is through its relationship with the United States. Well, that, that takes me to my last question, which is, I, I recall that Japan is building, aside from a, a military defense industry, it's building its military. Mm -hmm. uh, it's building ships, and I don't know what else. Um, it, and certainly, it has the infrastructure and, and the engineering to do that. Um, and then you wonder exactly what the United States commitment is to help Japan. So, you know, we give money, weapons, whatnot, uh, you know, to so many countries for so many reasons uh, in terms of geopolitics. Are we, should we be, what is our future role with Japan in terms of uh, providing defense, of having mutual defense agreements, um, and of, um, you know, supporting them in, in new ways? 
Uh, what should the U.S. do going forward with Japan? Well, I think I think what the United States should do exactly what it's doing with Japan, which is which is maintaining a strong defense relationship. And that that reminds me, you know, we we talk about there's a huge U.S. military presence in Japan, of course, you know, and and Japan foots a big part of that bill, you know, so they are basically paying the United States a lot of money to maintain a, a fairly robust force structure in in that country. You know, when you look at Yokosuka, Japan, uh, Misawa, Kadena, uh, Yokota air bases, those are those are huge bases, and and almost everything being developed on those bases are is being developed through Japanese money. You know, so so it, it would be a, it would be Im almost impossible, I think, for the United States to maintain its presence in Asia without without the help of the Japanese. So so to be clear. The defense relationship is very much skewed in America's favor when it comes to the relationship with Japan. It, Japan the United States is not is not giving away weapon systems to Japan. Japan pays. They they collaborate with with their with their research and development. So I think you know the the short answer is I think the United States is is in a very good position in, in its defense relationship with Japan, and and it's because Japan. Has been very, very willing to to support American efforts to maintain that military presence and that military force. Yeah, everybody loves Japan. The U.S. loves Japan. It's really interesting how that has flowered out since the war, and everyone yeah. you talk to has gone there, wants to go there. You know, is attracted to it, including me and you. You spend plenty of time in Asia and in Japan, so the relationship I, I is more. I, I lived in Japan for seven years in the military. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Carl, thank you very much for this discussion. I, I really feel it's helpful to understand how things are doing, how our relationship with Japan is doing, and how what you know what the role of Japan is in uh, in Indo-Pacific. Thank you so much, Carl. Carl Baker, uh, senior advisor to Pacific Forum. Aloha. <laughs>